All right, everybody. Thank you for coming back. We are about ready to start our panel on governance. And um, we wanted to be uh, in keeping with the spirit of government in South Carolina, so we're running 10 minutes late. We, um, we've got a great panel. Before we start, I wanted to mention, though, that, and I don't see her here, but uh, one person I forgot to mention yesterday was uh, who had been responsible for getting this whole thing together was B. Gernt. And B must be outside, <laughs> wherever she is. Oh, okay, good. There she is. Um, we have got a great panel this morning and very timely because in South Carolina, as those of you who are from South here know, we are debating uh, seriously this time ethics reform in Columbia. And to Gus's point yesterday, what is an environmental issue? I think there are few people who would dispute the fact that governance and ethics is a core question for us as we try to promote environmental reforms everywhere in South Carolina and nationally and otherwise. One of the, we are, we were talking last night, South Carolina is not maybe fundamentally different than other states. We are just more radically uh, dysfunctional than other states. Um, we're sort of the leading edge of governmental dysfunction. <laughs> But uh, today we're going to hear from people who are going to explain to us how that may change. Um, and you've already, you've already heard uh, my introduction of Gus yesterday, so I will not repeat his biography, um, ex and, and, except to say that his book, um, America the Possible, is, was very inspiring to me and many people on our staff who read it because Gus does expand this realm of what is the appropriate arena for those of us working in environment to encompass government, good government, and ethics. And um, he will be the moderator today. So again, thank you all for coming, and we're going to have three more excellent panels. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dana asked me to, to be the moderator, and I've been sitting up here trying to work up a little moderation. <laughs> Comes hard. Um, people uh, ask, have asked me when I've been going around mercilessly sticking my book in their, under their noses for the past uh, six, eight months, uh, people ask me, what can I do? Uh, what are, how do we begin uh, to pursue some of these issues? And I, I, I say there are really two things, uh, two, two places to begin. Uh, one is to begin in your communities. Uh, to, to bring the future into the present in our towns and cities and neighborhoods and, and local regions. And uh, we heard a lot of great ideas yesterday uh, about how to do that, didn't we? And uh, then I say the other thing we desperately need to do is to come together uh, across the whole political spectrum and work to save our failing politics. Because if we can't straighten out our politics uh, so the, the country can get some things done, uh, then you know nothing else is going to work uh, in the long run. We can do a lot of things at the local level, but as some of the speakers pointed out yesterday, we need action not only at the local and state level, but we need it at the national, indeed international level uh, also. And I think we all sense that we uh, are in a terrible situation with regard to our politics today. And so I'm just very delighted to have three people up here with me on the panel who are going to explain how we can fix our politics, right? And straighten everything out uh, and set us down the, uh, the right track. And I'm going to introduce them uh, and then let them speak and then introduce the next person. And after we go through about uh, 15 minutes uh, for each person, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will, and I, I will try to monitor that. Um, and we will uh, then throw the panel open to ask questions to themselves and then throw it open to, to you and have some discussion uh, with the uh, audience. Uh, and, and so in, in no uh, particular order, we want to begin, uh, to, and, and the speakers can take to the podium or stay in their chairs as, as they choose. 
Uh, I want to begin with uh, Lynn Teague, who I had the pleasure of just meeting at this conference, even though she was she was born in the um, uh, in in the little hometown that Cameron and I grew up in in Orangeburg, South Carolina. But she promptly left, uh, <laughs> and uh, and she ended up uh, uh, on the faculty of the uh, Arizona State Museum at the University of Arizona. She was curator of archaeology there. Uh, and among other things, worked on the repatriation of uh, Native American objects uh, and, uh, and sacred materials. Uh, and then in 2002, she returned uh, to uh, South Carolina. And um, uh, when did you start the work with the uh, League of Women Voters? Two years ago. So for the last two years, she's been the director of advocacy uh, for the League of Women Voters. And I, won't have to tell you what that group uh, is all about and how wonderful they are here and uh, around around our country. So, Lynn, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm going to be speaking about South Carolina's past and future in government ethics and uh, how that is grounded in the, the larger structure of our government. In the past several years, we've seen a long series of ethical problems involving members of our executive and legislative branches of South Carolina's government. In the Senate, they'll tell you it's not their problem, but we're not convinced. Uh, we have seen how porous our ethics laws are and how feeble their enforcement can be. The focus has broadened from these individual cases to include reform of our ethics laws. However, the potential for ethical problems is deeply embedded in our state's political culture. Better ethics laws are essential but not sufficient to give South Carolina a government that is focused on the good of all the people. The history that underlies that is long. Around the State House, many people like to think back to 1991, Operation Lost Trust, when our current ethics laws were written. Others look back even further to the South Carolina Constitution of 1895. Indeed, that Constitution provided a funhouse mirror version of the federal separation of powers, in which the domination of the legislative branch distorts all aspects of South Carolina's government. However, the groundwork for our intractable problems with political ethics has been in place for much longer. Our problems are a nat natural outgrowth of centuries of political institutions and culture. South Carolina began as a colony that was designed to have its own hereditary aristocracy, landgraves and caciques who were given massive baronies throughout the Lowcountry. Other settlers received much less land or tragically themselves were reduced to property. South Carolina's government was designed to look back to feudal roles of nobility and peasants, to stark contrast in power, wealth and influence rather than forward to a more balanced political system. I'm not going to trace the entire history of this system in 15 minutes, but one example illustrates much of what has been wrong with our government for centuries. It is a story that continues to be lived out today, changing only the specific names and offenses. It happened 270 years ago. The Commons House of Assembly of South Carolina opened on Monday, the 10th of October, 1743, with direction to the Committee on the State and Defense of the Province to inquire whether a silver mine hath been found and opened or intended to be opened in any of the Indian nations and to consider how far the same may affect the peace and tranquility of this province. Dr. John Rutledge, as chair, reported for the committee. They had met with the Honorable Upper House of Assembly and found that their honors were of opinion that the opening of a silver mine would greatly increase the riches of and would no way affect the peace and safety of the province, which your committee could not agree to. Dr. Rutledge expressed fears that warfare with the Indian nations would follow from this. He and his committee went on to call witnesses and hold hearings. When all was said and done, it was found that the members of the Upper House who had said this was such a wonderful idea were, in fact, the ringleaders in the illegal mine, the very same individuals who had expressed such strong support. In order to fill their own pockets, they, along with their friends and families, had endangered the survival of the inland townships that had been established less than a decade before. The prominent principal figures in the mine were assisted by less powerful individuals who saw an opportunity to benefit from the project and from association with the colony's leaders. 
The only dis dissenter who cooperated fully with the House Committee was Christopher Rowe of Orangeburg. It would be nice to think he was a man of exceptional integrity. I don't know that he wasn't, but it may be more to the point that he was an Indian trader who was likely to be the first to die if there was a war. So what are the core elements of this tale and why does it matter today? First, we see no evidence of an executive branch anywhere in the picture. In a well-balanced government, you would think that a violation of a treaty would surely have been investigated and punished by the executive branch. They are responsible for ensuring that laws and treaties are respected. Not so in South Carolina. It was left to a legislative committee which took action, in this case, largely out of the determination of one man. Second, we find a classic undisclosed conflict of interest. Members of the upper house attempted to hide their own involvement in the illegal enterprise while they used their official positions to protect it. We see among those leaders also a willingness to sacrifice the well-being of much of South Carolina, essentially the whole back country, to their own wealth and that of their friends, families, and communities. Little has changed in the intervening 270 years. We still have an executive branch that is disgracefully weak. Even if all of the structural reforms before the legislature at present are enacted, which is unlikely, uh, we will still have an executive branch that is weak. We still have public officials who can hide their own economic interests that conflict with those of the vast majority of our state citizens and use their official positions to push forward enterprises that serve the state as a whole very badly. Whether the issue is where our very limited transportation funds will be spent or the future of, private, of public education, private advantage shapes the political conversation in South Carolina. Legislative leaders who are accountable only to a relatively small number of voters in their own districts can direct funding to developments that serve those districts rather than to badly needed statewide projects. The processes that shape our judiciary are also not what they ought to be. The Judicial Merit Selection Board is stacked with legislators and relatives of le legislators. The budget of the courts is controlled by the General Assembly. Popular election of judges is never a good idea, but we need a system that involves less legislative influence. Local government also suffers. Until the 70s, county delegations made up of those members of the General Assembly from a single county ran local government. Some authority was transferred to county councils in the 70s, but county delegations and networks of commissions and boards appointed by legislators and overseeing everything from elections offices to recreation districts continue today to limit the ability of cities and counties to govern themselves, thus accounting for the two and a half hours it took me to vote in the last election. As a resident of Richland County, I saw the worst of what can happen. Another aspect of our political institution deserves attention, and that's the bureaucracy, which is often regarded as a bad thing. As a professional anthropologist, I see bureaucracies quite differently. The distinguishing mark of a mature state-level government is a fully developed apolitical bureaucracy to carry out the responsibilities of that government and provide continuity when the people at the top change. Elected officials dictate policy directions, but the bureaucracy itself must be sufficient to do the job assigned to it. That is under attack, too, in South Carolina. Much of our bureaucracy reports to legislatively appointed boards and commissions that disperse authority and eliminate accountability. Who can we hold responsible when the State Transportation Infrastructure Bank or the County Recreation Commission makes a rotten decision? Everyone and no one. Meanwhile, an interlocking network of political patronage originating principally in the General Assembly solidifies the power of the legislative branch. Putting this all together, it's obvious that South Carolina's problem is a political system and a statewide political culture that accepts that system. Ethical problems are often defined by public scandals involving individuals. But South Carolina's government does not, on the whole, suffer from an abundance of brilliantly Machiavellian power brokers. The pathetic reality is that no one has to be especially clever to ex assume excessive power in our government. A lack of balanced branches of government and rules that allow individuals within the General Assembly to assume disproportionate power create the opportunities for abuse of power. Year after year, century after century, someone is always going to fall into the right place at the right time. Sadly, after centuries of this political culture, many of the people of South Carolina 
have a version of the Stockholm Syndrome. They identify with a system that has kidnapped their government and holds them hostage and fail to see any alternative. So what can we do? The most important ethics reform legislation would restructure South Carolina's government. The executive branch, accountable statewide, should have the authority to oversee the normal executive functions of the state. However, we definitely need action on legislation that specifically addresses ethical concerns. On that front, things have been moving rapidly since last December, as everyone realized that passing complex legislation this requ year required an early start. In December, ethics reform hearings were held by the South Carolina Commission on Ethics Reform, a group appointed by the governor and chaired by two former attorneys general. The Senate Ethics Committee held public hearings following up on internal studies that were begun in the preceding summer. The House, true to form, held separate Republican and Democratic ethics reform committee meetings. The problems that have arisen since then reflect, again, South Carolina's long political history. As the legislative session began, Freshman Representative Beth Bernstein introduced ethics reform bills on January 23rd. The Governor's Commission produced a report on January 28th. On the 6th of February, Senator Wes Hayes filed bills reflecting the thinking of the Senate Committee. A few bills were filed in the House in early March, and then nothing happened. There were a few subcommittee meetings that didn't go anywhere, and nothing happened. And then on April 11th, another bill was filed in the House, sponsored by House leadership. There was no content, nothing but a lengthy title that showed that it was to be a complete rewrite of the ethics laws. But how was absolutely unknown to the public. Turns out it was unknown also to some of the legislators who were voting on it. In a proce process that had no precedent in loving memory, the bill went through subcommittee and full committee in the next two working days of the legislature still with no text available to the public, while legislators worked primarily from summaries of the bill. The content of the bill was made public only the day after it passed judiciary. This process is in itself eloquent testimony to the excessive power of leadership positions in our General Assembly. There were some very desirable elements in the original form of this new bill, among them independent oversight of enforcement and sound criteria for personal economic disclosures. However, there were two big surprises, which again, some of the people who'd voted on the bill in subcommittee and committee were not aware of. The bill decriminalized almost all ethical violations. <clears throat> Strange they would forget to mention that. And it criminalized advocacy by citizen groups unless their representatives registered as lobbyists, just as if they were paid lobbyists for a major corporation. This bill was amended and passed the House in time to become the vehicle for ethics reform in this year. The amended form lost not only the two surprise provisions that offended so many, but also many of the desirable elements found in the original bill. Independent oversight in the original bill had become an internal committee of the General Assembly. The members of the committee were to be selected on a partisan basis. The guarantee of equal representation for the minority party reassured members of that party, but also sent a strong message about the inability of the General Assembly to envision a truly independent body that is concerned only with the law and the evidence, rather than politics. Further, personal economic disclosure requirements had been substantially weakened so that Swiss cheese is a poor analogy because, in fact, in this case, there were more holes than cheese. Those disclosures are crucial to reform. We're often talking about campaign finance when we talk about ethics, and campaign finance is very important. But for a variety of political reasons, we never doubted that the bills that we would see would take care of making sure that it was fixed so that we knew who was donating to independent PACs and so forth. Powerful people needed that. However, the big money problems in South Carolina today tend to be in the area of things like consulting fees, and advantages to businesses, um, income not reported that is in fact direct income, not campaign money. <clears throat> this takes us back to where we were in 1743. Um, now the House bill has crossed to the Senate. On Tuesday, I was in a subcommittee meeting where they um, replaced the House, they did a strike and, and insert. They completely replaced the House bill with their own. 
Uh, I got a bootleg copy of that last night. It's in Judiciary Committee, even as we speak. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen there. But um, <clears throat> the heavily amended Senate version is still not available to the public. We, we have not seen a session where it was so hard to get information as this, this past one. The disclosures include not just income, and by income we mean consulting fees and so forth, as opposed to the Ethics Commission here definition of income, which is only salaries and wages. Income to an official, the official's family, and a business that is owned in whole or in part by the uh, official. This matters a lot, this last part especially. As long as an official can establish an LLC, receive payments from diverse sources, but report only that a salary has been received from the LLC, we have a disclosure requirement that you can drive a truck through. In the current Senate bill, it is, there is a, a great improvement over what we saw earlier. There isn't fully independent oversight, but there is a lot more transparency and there's a lot more professionalism. They're bringing in the state agencies who actually know how to do an investigation. SLED, the Attorney General, Revenue Department, Inspector General, and the Ethics Commission to do the investigations. Some opposition to independent oversight is couched in terms of a principal stand on maintaining the balance of powers between branches of government. However, as we've discussed, South Carolina does not have a desirable balance of powers to protect. What we have is an 800-pound gorilla of a legislature and 90-pound weaklings everywhere else in state and local government. Executive branch enforcement of ethics violations would not leave us at risk of a weakened and vulnerable legislature. The other objection to external oversight is frankly focused on fear of politically motivated attacks. The atmosphere of fear around the State House when you're talking ethics reform is just amazing. And some of it is because people have, know they've been walking a thin line or have gone over it, but a lot of it is, is simply because they spend all their time thinking about their political partisan issues against each other. Uh, for this reason, the League of Women Voters would love to see fully independent oversight. I don't think we're going to get it. But the current Senate bill is much better than what we've seen before. We don't know what will happen to it. It could be amended in bad ways this morning. It could be stopped on the floor. But if we get this, it will be a very positive step forward. For the first time in 343 years, we'll have a full accounting of where our officials are getting their money will have a reasonable chance of doing something about it if they have a conflict of interest and don't recuse themselves when they should and attempt to use their position for their, themselves. It would be a glorious experiment that might set South Carolina free to be a better place for all of us. Thank you.